This is the Iron Sharpens Iron Movement, sharing insights into the power of people-centric leading. Hi, this is Jim, and today we're going to welcome to our tribe a former executive vice president and chief information officer of the Caesars Entertainment Empire. He's a renowned expert in innovation and digital leadership in business through the implementation of disruptive technologies. Someone with a passion that lies in expanding the creative thought processes and cultivating business disciplines required for today's 21st century leaders. Please welcome to the show, Les Otto Lenge. The Iron Sharpens Iron movement is brought to you by N2 Growth, a leader in executive search, leadership development, and talent management. We find and develop the world's best leaders. Learn more about our practice by visiting us at n2growth.com or click on the link in the show notes of this podcast. Hi, Iron Sharpens Iron Tribe. Great episode coming up with Les. You are going to really enjoy it. I think he's going to knock your socks off with the information that he provides. But I wanted to give you an, kind of an editorial comment. Les and I recorded this episode way back in March. And you're going to hear sprinkled throughout the interview uh, us referring to COVID and the pandemic back in the time frame of March. So the context of a lot of those comments uh, kind of don't relate today. Uh, because of everything that we have figured out since then. So I don't want that to be a distractor at all because you are going to love this episode. Keep in mind, it was just recorded back in March and due to scheduling, we weren't able to get Les's episode out until this week. So I really hope you enjoy it. Please don't forget to leave your comments and back to the show. Hi, Les. Welcome to the show today. We're glad to have you. And I tell you, there's probably no greater time in our history that's happening right now that uh, we need, you know, some thoughts from leaders that have your background, you know, someone that's a, that's a known innovator, someone that embraces technology and can kind of start to see in the future about how we can utilize these tools from a leadership perspective. So welcome to the Iron Sharpens Iron Leadership Movement. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Les, uh, you know, at the time of this recording, we're going through the uh, coronavirus crisis here in America. Uh, we're several days into kind of the mandated uh, social distancing and things like that. So it's it's very interesting times in our history. Be really interested uh, to get some of your thoughts about what should leaders be thinking about in today's world? You've got such a background in strategic planning and Basically, the world's just been turned upside down. So are there some fundamentals that are timeless? Doesn't matter if it's in crisis or in good times. From your perspective, what are some things that we should be thinking about? Well, you know, these times all bring very sharp relief to the questions around just what is leadership? Hmm. How do you look at um, the bigger picture? What are the opportunities to not only uh, learn from these situations, but what are we to be doing you know, in the midst of what is essentially a, a crisis? How do we see things for what they are? And, and I think about this from a uh, leadership perspective as I've been through different disruptions or crises and seen things that it takes in order to not only understand what the options are, but figure out through collaboration, through understanding, through some levels of detail, what we need to do to be decisive. What do we need mm. to do to reassure, bring a stress set of strength and confidence to not only the conversation, but the actions that take place. And that from a leadership point of view, project a sense of calm and stability. And I, I liken that to, to a few of the uh, situations I've actually been involved with directly and for which I had to take action as a leader, for which we had uh, to react when I was in, in a particular executive role uh, to a crisis. <clears throat> and it seems to be now a, a much more environmental condition. So uh, right. that's why I think this particular situation, as you asked the question, is probably emblematic of what we're going to see on a repeated basis in a, in a much more rapid fashion 
a recurring basis in the next 10 years. When you look at this decade, it's almost symbolic that it started on January 1 in a, in a uh, very real way for the United States uh, of 2020 as a kickoff to, to this decade. Don't want to be dire about it, but I think we're going to see more and more of this. Absolutely. And so you, you mentioned in there about seeing things for what they are. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I've, I've been around those leadership tables before when you're going through a decision making process and you just wonder, is this the information uh, that we're being fed? Is it correct or not? Is, is that one of the biggest things? Is it about perception when you say th- see things for what they really are are you kind of referring to that about not getting caught up in the perception of things but in the reality of things what yeah help me yeah, you want to you, you want to live on the front end of the reality that you recognize the events and their significance and don't shy away from the consequences of, of what you're seeing but you have to get the the information in your own mind clear and um and directly as much as possible from the various sources, the ways that you you solicit information, and that is data. You know, data is a wonderful thing. Um, there's that that famous saying, and I'm not sure that it it is accurate to attribute it to Mike Bloomberg, but he said it. You know, God, we trust everybody else bring data. So <laughs> when you look at situations where you're in a a crisis or you have a disruption, you look at what are the elements of information I need? Where am I getting them from? Am I getting them from systems, for instance? Are we are we taking a look at our sensory capabilities to watch an operation, a country, an environment operate? So in the context of coronavirus, what are the true number of people who are infected? What do spreaders look like? Is the role to isolate or is it to create herd immunity? So what are your options here? And what experts, when you go beyond the sensory, who have accumulated not only knowledge, but have had lots of data that they synthesized and have these analysis in their, in their heads, um, can provide you in terms of what are your best of the multiple options to pursue. And then ultimately, who do you trust? Who do you trust when you're speaking to them that they've been calm, dispassionate, or objective? They understand what... Uh, is going on around them, but they also understand their particular area of expertise. And you align that in much the way that you've seen in, in uh, demonstrative and in, in leadership in the past in government, in times of conflict, where you have a, a, a war room, for lack of a better yep. way to describe it, but a council that you go to and you solicit the best. I mean, Abraham Lincoln did this in what was this sort of uh, role where he had all his competitors or rivals together, but he knew they knew what they were talking about, so he could sit them down and talk to them and get the greatest expertise. I think John Kennedy did the same sort of thing, but in other ways, looking for the best of the intellect of, of those who surrounded him for advice. And it's going through and counseling against all of these things, the data, the uh, what would be the inherent knowledge and then sort of the expertise to get to where your options are. And then you get to some collaboration from stakeholders, but a decision. Do you believe that the modern leader has to change the way that they view what competencies are most important to be a leader? Because, you know, I, I, he used to talk to folks about, you know, they were always, you know, hey, I'm getting data. You know, I'm, I'm into big data. You know, for starters, I don't know if they even could define what big data was and what that meant. But my, right. always, my first question to them was, okay, even if you have the data, it's what you do with it is the most important thing. Yeah, clearly. Clearly, it's what you do with it. Um, and ha- have you figured out where – you know, what's the scope of, of these issues? Can you see the big enough picture and understand what that data means to you in the context? And I, I, I always like to start there. If, if I can't assemble the big picture, then I, I'm not going to act on any data. Um, once I can assemble the big picture and it's coherent and it meets enough of the criteria for me to understand that I'm correct based on science, based on the math, based on the data, the situation, in right. other words, the, the, the fact and truth-telling of the situation, then I can begin to have confidence level in that big picture and then understand what all the other mechanisms that have 
activities, work streams, whatever it is to react to a crisis potentially are necessary in order to lead. Um, it's not shying away from the information for sure. It's not discounting it just because I don't understand it. And it certainly can't be wishful thinking. And we've seen examples of all of this, unfortunately, here in the first stages of what is the coronavirus in reaction. Yeah, you um, bet. Uh, so, you know, and then there are people who were canaries in the coal mine uh, on that and were trying to get the attention, but they were coming with data. And that was, that's the big miss that, that happened. Exactly. Absolutely. And, and with that, then if they were, does it, does it take, I'll come back to this. Does it take a new type of leader to understand this context to one, define the area that you talked about, but to be able to have trust in it and to be able to give, um, value to the fact that what they're receiving is giving them the information to make the proper decision to move out on whatever the course of action that they decide on. The leader today in 2020, how do they look different than a leader in 1980, say? Uh, I think the leader today is more connected, more networked. We had... um, a very different way of looking at information and decentralizing or centralizing authority back in 1980. You, it was purely, um, you know, hierarchical, top down, um, and depending on the type of organization, it might have been even autocratic. Yeah. But today, it it's very decentralized. So it is a, a leader who is comfortable with that notion of a networked enterprise, a networked society, and that the decision-making should be more localized and decentralized. Um, However, I think history proves that the best leaders always thought that, particularly when you had battlefields, uh, you you would look at decentralizing authority as much as calling the command. Exactly Um, right. And so you you have... um, uh, you don't have those Byzantine problems where you get, you know, you don't see what's going across the the the, the, the field of battle. But what you are looking at today is a leader who can appreciate and understand the mechanisms of what being connected means, being networked is, and what decentralized authority looks like, and how that can be basically self healing for an organization. Why that works, um, and there are lots of good examples. But cyber attacks are a great example of that. What can you do to actually decentralize and mitigate risk by pushing out to the edge, pushing it in different places so that one central point of attack or weakness would be vulnerable or available, an attack plane, and that that would cause a lot of problems. And so leaders who understand these network environments, who understand cybersecurity at its fundamental levels, are probably better adjusted for leading today in any other circumstance. Oh, that's interesting. And so, th- so that type of leader do, do they also have to find this inherent sense of? And you had mentioned this word before: trust. Is is it trust in the systems? Trust in people? Trust in this decentralized environment that they're in? Does yeah. the you know we, we talk a lot on this podcast episodes about uh, human centric portions of leading and and trusting the human and all of that? Does it it still come down to that primal trust? between each other, but then also trust in systems too? I think it does. I think it's a new trust protocol. And that trust protocol is a way of um, ensuring that you've communicated the right things to the right people in the right way. You don't want the wrong information to go out if you have to make the, 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 um, the change or the order or you have the command. Um, But you also want for those who are making decisions at the front line of a problem, let's say it's nurses and, and doctors or healthcare workers in the case of coronavirus, administering these tests to see if somebody is actually positive, test positive for coronavirus. So wh- how, how are they administering it? How are they managing it so that they don't create chaos in the testing process? How do we get clear and accurate results? So you can set a framework for what everyone should do. And then everyone should add back to within that framework that they're operating under those 
protocols or those directions so that everyone has the same data. You know, you see that in sort of the um, uh, blockchain world. You see that in trust ledgers or general ledgers that are out there, these, these things that we've been uh, associating primarily with cryptocurrency, but which is probably not really the right place to apply these distant trust uh, protocols. So I think it's the shift towards that in a networked world where you can put a lot of information at the edge of the network, a lot of decision-making down to the people who are actually activating and doing things, who are, have their hands on the situation, and just have this insurance of what are the, the proper rules to be executed, that everybody confirms those rules have been executed, and then we know that we're good to go, we're good to move forward. And that's a lot mm-hmm. faster than the industrial age model where you have to wait for all the information to move from one place to another to make the next change in command. So... With like your CIO hat on and, and all of that, what are some of the key communication tools that you've seen to be very successful? And what are some fundamentals that I guess you would say is the key to communicating in the 21st century? Uh, you know, what what are potentially some foundational ones that have never changed? But what do you what do you think are the keys to proper communications to achieve exactly what you just so talked about? Well, you know, you, you have to have, in our case, a broader society, which is communicating effectively across the society. Um, mm. And I think we have elements of that. We've got the Internet now. With everybody staying at home, having to work from home if they're still gainfully and hopefully gainfully employed. Uh, but even as you and I are doing, if we didn't have the Internet, we wouldn't have this conversation. We couldn't disseminate hopefully what will be marginally important information right. or helpful information from our conversation. <laughs> That's right. Um, and what I, I think you can see is that that mechanism in place is a really good thing and that companies and enterprises and organizations and now our government can connect and communicate and coordinate the speed by which, for instance, drugs are now being approved by the FDA, which probably is a process that needed to be repealed anyway, but under crisis now will be repealed. Uh, You'll see instead of years for a a drug test, uh, maybe weeks, possibly days for something that might be beneficial. Sharing of information from research institutes under that same example as another good outcome. Um, But maybe just as important, the ability of a doctor and a patient to speak to each other through a mobile device. So if I have an iPhone, I can telemedicine slash FaceTime, whatever it might be, with my doctor, but also just imagining the ability to do an analytic off of the phone, a small blood pinprick, you know, and uh, do an analysis and share that with the doctor or the doctor's systems in the cloud against some DNA that I might have submitted under certain privacy and, and, and privacy rights, some digital sovereignty. Um to the to that doctor's a- a- analytics system, and then be able to, of course, diagnose my problem, including possibly taking a, a swab and, and analyzing it for a virus. But if you you look at the social mechanisms, we see it working really well in certain ways and not so well in others. And this is what a leader has to recognize: they got to fight against not just the trust protocol that they want to put in place, but the lack of trust and that disinformation, misinformation. You know, that can lead to a crowded beach in Florida with a bunch of spring breakers who think because (laughs) they're between the ages of 18 and 22, they're not going to get this coronavirus. And by example, it turns out that now the numbers look like from France and from Italy and now even in the United States that 20 percent of the people coming into the emergency rooms are not, uh, you know, 70 to 80 percent, 70 years of age and older. They're actually the 18 to 30-year-olds, they're in acute problems, and they may have bigger issues. Not leveraging social media properly, getting disinformation, intentional or not, uh, getting misinformation because you pass along the wrong text without any bad intention, has led to a lot of what would be poor behaviors and outcomes. So the leaders got to recognize that they have this massive challenge of being super connected and correct and right and executing fast to the leverage of a networked economy and a network society. And they also have the tidal wave of massive problems, which can push them the other direction to react to. And how do you mitigate the lack of trust and truth? What do you do 
to define what is real, what is correct data, what is right information, and how everyone should then coordinate and act on it. It's such a, it's so interesting because you're so right about, as you were talking, I was just thinking it would have been so simple if this was just in a vacuum that, okay, these are the proper ways to communicate in the 21st century. This is how it's all done. And it's just amazing to me that there's a counter to every statement that's made. You know, the amount of disinformation, the amount of people that are looking to exploit how the speed of communication works and, and, and quite frankly, to exploit the weakness of people's inherent trust that, well, if it's on the Internet, it must be true. And those kind of things, um, it actually makes it more complicated, potentially. It, it does. But, but I, here's what I would suggest. We've had that same problem in cybersecurity, and we're beginning to resolve that in massive ways. So if you take the approach to cybersecurity as a lesson plan, a framework of thinking, a way of understanding the networked world we live in, we've gone from just trying to protect to actually a predict, prevent, detect, and respond. And so we've moved from this perimeter protection Great of point. hardware and you know, CIOs talk about this stuff, so it sounds pretty boring, but, but ultimately I think it, it is meaningful. But we, we've gone from protecting our perimeters with, you know, firewalls and, and a little bit of software here and there to actually thinking about it as we're in a software war, bring software to it and use data. So don't, don't bring hardware to a software war. And by the way, when you're in that battle, think about what can you predict? What can you assess as the risk? What can you anticipate as the threat? What can you define as your posture for protection? And then what assets are incredibly important to continue to do that kind of identification or prediction? So what's your data analytic look like? And then preventing it means how quickly are you to adapt? How self-healing can you be? Can you establish that digital trust between different parts of the uh, ecosystem that you live in, in our world today, our health system as a country or as a globe? What can we do to harden that and make it better and then act, actively monitor it, actively detect? Like we should have been active to detect this virus. There was really one person, and, I, and this is really weird that it's almost there, but maybe two people, um, certainly the, he, the head of the intelligence committee uh, from the center from North Carolina, I believe it is. Uh, Meadows. Brooks, and then, and then you, we had uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates has been like, you know, Bill Gates doesn't come off with this super strong, loud voice. So it sounds almost like he's lulling you when he talks. But he was really saying very loudly in <laughs> Bill Gates' terms, there's going to be a pandemic, folks. Boy, oh boy, you better get ready. I've been looking at this data for gosh knows how long. I watched H1N1. I watched Ebola. My wife and I have a foundation. We're focused on this stuff. And notice that he stepped away from all corporations in yes, this last did. 10 days. And he's only focusing on the environment and what the environment will do to create these un unfortunate problems and the chances we have then to respond. How do we investigate the incident? How do we contain it? How do we remediate it? How do we design policy changes that are actually going to make a difference? And those sort of things, I think, are the model as a leader you have to be aware of and understand to fit into the 21st century and in the decades to come. Because if you don't have that capability as a CEO, gosh, what are you going to do? You're going to always turn to your CIO? Well, the CIO is then the default CEO. So right. what's your role? And ultimately, if you're going to help your CEO as a CIO, as a leader, you better be able to, in very clear terms, crisp, more succinct than I even just articulated, what, explain what predict, prevent, detect, and respond looks like. That's where you get the wins. That's how you actually establish um, credibility and trust. That's the center of trust uh, for being able to then create a trust protocol for an entire organization. Uh, that is, it's amazing how my blinders have just expanded outwards now that, uh, you know, I was, I was centered into seeing a portion of the world, uh, that I was predisposed to think about. And now you've just made me think of it in completely different terms, especially from a leadership perspective. And as you were talking, one of the things that I was reflecting on is, you know, we, we concentrate a bit on resiliency from a human perspective, but 
really you're talking about this resilience from a systems perspective also about how right. you've got to have that proper sense of resilience to that. You do. Keep it in mind, we're all a networked system, whether we want to believe it or not. I'm not talking <laughs> you know, the, the, the latest Terminator movie. Uh, right. <laughs> but I, what I'm saying is we're, we're a, a network society. We are an ecosystem. We are a system now that is very chained together. You saw the most dramatic drop in any equity markets in the last two weeks faster than any other time because of the accelerated nature of a big interconnected globe. We saw a virus spread faster than it would even 10 years ago because of yep. super interconnected globe on a transportation basis, which by the way, got more rapid because of technology, which got more interconnected because you could map more flights across China to the rest of the globe. And the spreader of that virus was just like a virus on a computer network. So yeah, I, I think that if we could address risk as leaders in the severity and where we are in terms of response and be able to articulate that in clear, in very crisp terms for our society, for our enterprise, for our organizations, for our departments, for our employees, then you can then get to what people need. But the broader sense for a leader today, and I, I would just offer this because I see it, in, and I saw it in Las Vegas as the CIO for Caesars because I had to live through it, this, um, were, were two things. Um, one, we've got a behavior, a natural behavior for leaders that we have to understand has changed. My son loves to play video games. He's 12 years old, and he's really good at two of them, so he's like a ranked player. <laughs> All right. And, and so the, the fun thing is that he's got followers. Now, he can't show his face mm. on the screen because he's not 14, not 13, so he can't do that. But he can call his games and they can listen to him. And he's got a cool gamer tag it's called Drawn Thunder. So he's really cool. So it sounds fun. And like, and he has um, he has uh, Twitch streamers who like to talk to him. And, you know, they like do all these things. And he's in, in this different behavior. He's a 12-year-old who's got you know, 25-year-old friends in a, in a very safe way. But he's got a way to interact now as a networked kid in a behavior that's completely changed. And by the way, one of the things we're going to find out from all these sports and sporting events being shut down is that yep. people kept playing video games and kept having esport tournaments online virtually. Oh boy. Yes. And they weren't quitting their old behaviors. They were just migrating them to a networked behavior. And, and if in 2020, this year, the esport world was supposed to overtake the NFL in terms of revenue, now it will. There's no question. Esports will crush the NFL in terms of revenue this year. It's not even going to be close. So wow. when you think about sports betting, you think about all the things that I know in Las Vegas, um, that's a big sea change. But the broader thing that I learned from Las Vegas was we had a horrible event in uh, October 1, 2017. So we had a yes. massive shooting, largest mass shooting in U.S. history, okay, this most devastating event. And we understood very clearly before the event, but even more so after the event, that protection this interconnected way of protecting people is a cultural value and that people look at protection, privacy, and trust as now as a perceived right. That is huh. their own digital sovereignty. And as a uh, executive, I have to think about that as part of not just the customer experience, but the core value of the company. And that is an affirmative, uh, you know, an affirmative consent about information, a, a right of accounting like this GDPR or CCPA, uh, a protection, a direction, a response, an analysis to all threats so that I can actually help the individual who I'm considering a, uh, a, a, some kind of relationship on a transactional basis, but probably much more than that because I'm sharing lots of information rather than just dollars with them. And if... You look at the coronavirus, you look at leadership, and you start to shift your thinking into the broader sense and into the little events that occur to you as a leader to respond to disruptions, respond to, to crises. You can see that the change goes quickly on that trust. When we look at coronavirus, you can break it down that in February, maybe 25% across the board of the country was worried about it. Mm -hmm. Now it's what ninety nine point something. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I mean, that's other exactly than the kids right. on the beach, other than the kids on the beach in Florida, um, but let's just put it seventy five percent. 
that uh, probably a good number because if you took Democrats and Republicans in their last surveys, they're all there at around 73, 74%. Yep. That still correlates with the kinds of events and risks you would see in cybersecurity. So the risk environments are very similar in a network world across the globe on any area, whether it's a shooting, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's a disruption on a coronavirus. It's all around that 75, 80 percent of the people get really worried about this stuff. As a leader, you better be prepared for your reaction to all these different types of risks which we live with now every day because we're so hyper-connected. So that risk framework, that crisis management approach to what I said at the very beginning of of our conversation, see things for what they are. Look at the strategy in detail. Look at your multiple options. Collaborate quickly. Have a trust protocol in place and be decisive. Is all necessary for success as a leader in this time. Well, Les, I tell you what, I think that was an exclamation point on how you just summarized the entire conversation. And I think this is a great time to to stop because these are the foot stompers that I think the modern leader, no matter where you are in the organization, but certainly at top of pyramid, these are the points that we need to take away. And uh, I appreciate your level of expertise. And it's so amazing to me, too, how you were able to connect the dots on something like the coronavirus into the networking, the interconnected globe on how it just works. And it all ends up, no matter what type of leadership perspective we are talking about, trust protocols. Uh, that's a, that's a, I love I love that statement. Uh, I'm going to steal it from you uh, because I think uh, I think it really it really summarizes uh, no matter how an, what angle you come from that it's going to boil down to the proper trust protocols in everything that's interconnected into that the risk and response and how succinctly it's going to be. And I will selfishly say I am a gigantic football fan and you've just crushed my <laughs> spirit by uh by saying that esports is going to surpass it in revenue. That is amazing to me but it absolutely absolutely makes sense and now I'm going to watch that. Here, here I'll give you a little br- give you a little bridge of hope on that one. So two things. <laughs> one um uh, if you have family members, young family members, it doesn't matter, kids, uh, nephews, nieces, so on, um, just be very uh, confident in this hope. They will physically grow old without major injuries. That's a good thing, okay? Um, and, and, you Great know, point. I, play, I played backyard football, and, and it didn't prove to be any good for me, so I end up running track and field. The, <laughs> uh, but the second thing is that if you really enjoy that sport, the adaptive side of that sport looks like being able to lean in and participate. And where, we, where we've seen it in experimentation, there's immersive technology, of course, VR and so on. But where we've seen it really is that um, you have basketball and a lot of basketball is being perceived as now having to become a lean-in sport as, rather than a sit-back. And that's because the youth, even though they like basketball and they've done a great job of marketing NBA globally, plays more – uh, MBA online and games than they do actually go to events. So there's more interaction with the players that way. And now there's adaptive look at basketball to be able to play basketball as if you were on the court during the game and you can simulate playing against magic or you could simulate ah, playing against fascinating. Uh, Zion Williamson, my favorite player. now. Yeah. Uh, Zion nice. Amazing. Um, but my, my point is football is going <laughs> the same direction. You'll, you will, for the, all those, games that you wished you said man i could have been in there i could have caught that pass uh you'll get that option here within i think about five years you'll be able in there playing the game with them and people will be wagering on you or rooting for you or whatever it'll be a lot more fun so you're saying there's a chance i can still yeah, catch a pass from brady all right chance. i love yep. it i love it uh, he'll just be wearing a buccaneers uniform <laughs> that's right that's exactly right <laughs> Well, Les, thanks again for your time. Uh, This was probably the most valuable 30 minutes that any of our tribe listeners could hope for in a week full of turmoil uh, in the midst of the coronavirus. It's not only a mixture of thinking about what's going on in the outside world, but really how to make us better leaders. And that's the whole premise of Iron Sharpens Iron. So thanks again for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining our leadership movement this week. We really enjoyed talking to Les about trust protocols. Don't forget our show notes are posted on the website with key leader takeaways and suggested action plans. 
Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend so we can continue to build the tribe. Join our Facebook group to get even more behind the scenes action and exclusive content for leaders. Until next time, always remember that iron sharpens iron. Make yourself and others around you better every day.